Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Pyatt and welcome to my YouTube channel. My goal is to help as many martial artists as possible in their journey of Fujitsu, whether you are a complete beginner or whether you are an experienced martial artist. I hope that this channel will help give you advice, tips and detailed explanations of techniques that will help deepen your understanding of whatever martial art it is that you study. I do weekly videos every Friday, so if you enjoy and like this video, please feel free to subscribe. Don't forget to enable alerts to get them into your inbox every Friday. Uh, and feel free to check out the rest of the videos on our channel for more videos just like this one. This week's video is going to focus on one of the most fundamental topics in martial arts that is almost never talked about. And when it is, it's usually talked about poorly. This is a really important topic. And so for this reason, what I'd like you to do this week is, I know usually I say, you know, feel free to like and comment and those kind of things. What I'd really like you to do is to share this with as many of your martial arts friends as possible. Because I truly believe the topic we're going to talk about this week is something that we need to talk about more accurately and more precisely. The consequences of this topic are massive. And that, by the way, is the first shameless point of this video, because we're going to talk about the concept of mass or effective mass. So before we do that, we need to put a little bit of background and context into place. So follow me. So to go with this video, uh, I have done a blog on our website, so feel free, a lot of this information will be there in a bit more detail for you afterwards, and I'll put that in the description below. So I want to talk about force and before I talk about mass. And the reason is that martial artists have this tendency that in our training, everything that we do and we practice is very based upon feeling. And that's because martial arts is a very visceral uh, kind of, kind of uh, pastime. You know, you observe your teacher demonstrating the technique and quite often they will explain the technique based upon feeling, which is perfectly okay. And that can help you develop the correct application and execution of the technique. So the teacher demonstrates, they give you the feeling, you emulate, you copy, you practice, you try and get that feeling. And through intrinsic feedback, you know whether you get the technique right or wrong or not. That's, you know, that's, that's obvious. But Feeling alone, whilst you're, if you don't understand what it is you're trying to do, sometimes that feeling, although it's useful to get you to the end point, is it, it's slow. If you understand exactly what it is you're trying to do from a mechanical level, that process becomes an awful lot easier. The other thing that we're a bit guilty of in martial arts is using words that just quite simply we shouldn't use. We use very, a lot of pseudo-scientific terms and we use words completely out of context. So for example, I'm going to avoid the word weight in this video, like the plague, not because we can't talk about weight and its implications, but weight and mass are two completely different things. And it really isn't acceptable for me to talk about them, you know, uh, flippantly or without consideration of what I'm actually saying. So for the time being, I'm going to ignore weight and I will come back to that in a separate video and we're going to focus entirely on mass. So just bear in mind that words like force, power, if a teacher says to you, you know, you need to improve the strength of your technique or the force of your technique or the power of your technique, each of those things means something different. And so it's really important that we have a clarity as to what those words mean and what those concepts are. So this is Newton's second law. And, and if you want to read, find out more about the first and third, just have a look at the blog. I'm just going to focus on the second. Now, in words, Newton's second law is actually force is directly proportional to the rate of change of momentum. So if you're not a physicist, it's going to mean pretty much nothing to you. So this is the simple, sim it's not, not simplified form, but a special case of Newton's second law. So force is mass times acceleration. Now I don't want you to get thrown off by the equation, but I want you to realise that all equations actually are is relationships. So actually this equation gives us three important relationships. If I want to increase the force of a strike, as an example, I can either increase the mass that I use to deliver that force, or I can increase the acceleration. So I've got two relationships there. If mass goes up, force will go up. Or if acceleration goes up, force will go up. That's what we call directly proportional. They both go up. The other relationship we've got is, imagine I've got a constant force. Mass and acceleration are what we call inversely proportional. As one goes up, the other goes down. So as an example, if I've got two people who are uh, who both got the same muscular force, and they're going to try and accelerate their arm towards their opponent. They're going to try and do a punch, as an example. If one of them has got a much bigger mass, then if they can exert the exact same force, so the force is constant, because one has a bigger mass, he's going to, with that same force, he's not going to be able to generate as much acceleration with his strike. So he's going to be slower. Whereas the person with less mass, because they're exerting the same force, will have a greater acceleration. So the rule is, as mass goes up, acceleration goes down. And this creates a little bit of a limit on 
how much acceleration we're ultimately able to generate based upon our own mass. So that's something worth bearing in mind. And it's very different when you're talking about the force that your muscles are generating in order to accelerate your own body and the force that you exert on somebody else. Now, when I first looked at this equation, I always thought it was obvious to me how, obviously, if I have a higher acceleration, how that's going to cause more force. But even I originally, just in my head, had this misconception that well, is, you can't increase your mass because your mass is a fixed amount. And that is where we're going to really discuss today, the fact that actually mass isn't a fixed thing. Right? My total mass, or if I, you know, just to be generous to myself, uh, the average mass of a male in the UK is about 70 kilograms. I wish I was 70 kilograms, but hey ho, that's another story. So if I was to consider my 70 kilograms of mass, my 70 kilograms are my entire mass all acting together as one. But when I deliver a strike, my entire mass isn't acting as one. My entire mass only acts as one really when I'm considering my weight downwards. I said I wasn't going to use weight, but I did in that one context, forgive me. But if I'm doing a strike, I'm only going to use a part of my mass, right? So I'm going to break this down. And what we call it this is the effective mass, okay? With what proportion of my mass am I using to deliver my strike? So let me give you some examples of this. So I'm going to borrow Alan. Uh, first of all, right, if we think about the mass of the body, right, your body can behave as a fixed rigid mass and as lots of little rigid bits connected by wobbly bits, right? Or your joints. So as an example, if Alan locks his arm out for me, so he puts this, and you can do this at home, right? If you've got like just feet shoulder apart and you lock the arm, so effectively what you're doing is you're locking the body to create one rigid structure. In essence, your mass is gonna behave as one object in this point. So if I apply a force, right? The whole object moves, right? Now, the human body has this unique advantage that we can effectively uh, you know, control how much mass we use at any one time. So if instead of being locked out like this, if Alan now relaxes at the joints, when I exert force, I'm now not pushing against his entire mass. His entire mass doesn't move. I'm only pushing against a much smaller mass. And so if we use this process in reverse, the idea of building up mass so that we have the biggest effective mass possible when we strike, then we can increase the force. So to show you this, if we uh, just get the bag for a second. So if you think about the simplest thing that I could do, imagine that I was to take my hand, right? And I was gonna hit you with my hand. Now imagine I was to chop my hand off for a second. Now I can't do that, so as a, as a substitute, I'm gonna use a glove. So the average hand is about 500 grams or 0.5 kilograms, so if I was to accelerate that at say 20 meters per second squared, 20 times 0.5 is 10. So it'd give me 10 newtons of force. So as an example, if this is, if I was to chop my hand off and hit Alan with it and throw it, I think we can agree that that's not a particularly devastating technique, right? It's not gonna stop him particularly, right? So my hand on its own, very small mass, all I can really do to increase my force is to accelerate it more. Well, if I just hit with my hand, as we've established, there is not very much mass there, so there's not very much force. Well, what my body can do, in the same way that it can relax, it can become rigid. So by creating tension in my wrist, what I can do is use my hand and my arm together. So instead of just hitting like this, now I can hit with my hand and arm. So a bit more force. Then I can keep that chain going up. So now if I unify up to my shoulder, so I've got my hand, my arm, my shoulder, all hitting together, we get a little bit more force. Well, it's very difficult to actually use your shoulder and not use your hip. So then I want to unify my torso and my hip together. So now I get more force. And then if I then start to bring my legs into play, so I'm going to push the floor of my legs, I'm going to lock my hip. And that's something that instructors say all the time, push the floor of your feet, you know, push the floor of your back leg. The reason you're doing that is you're locking your body at that moment of in impact. So when you use the feet, you get more force still again. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to be rigid whilst you're moving. So remember that idea of mass is inversely proportional to acceleration. If I treat my body as a rigid mass like this, so it's rigid to begin with, and then I try to accelerate, I've got to accelerate my entire mass, which is slow. Whereas if I'm accelerating just my very light hand, I can accelerate a lot quicker. And at the moment of impact, 
create that tension to then increase my effective mass. So I don't want to be like this and be rigid to begin with. When you're moving, you need to be nice and relaxed and in that moment, at the moment of impact, then you create that tension. And that's really the true meaning of kime. So kime, when it was first explained to me, was like the snap in the technique, which is actually a really poor description in hindsight. Snap is obviously muchiken. But actually, that reason I was explained that way, and I was like 10 years old at the time, was that it actually did create a, an adequate feeling of kime. So I understood what I was trying to achieve in the technique, even though I didn't understand how it worked. And so with kime, that idea of being relaxed and at the moment of impact, that dynamic explosion of tension to unify your mass and unify it, so you, you rather than you having a very small mass, you have a higher effective mass, will massively increase the amount of force you can execute when you're doing a strike. But there's a bigger reason why this is so important, because it applies to everything. It isn't just striking. Imagine, for example, you were using a weapon. So imagine you're using a bow. You know, it's the idea that when you use a bow, you don't just want to just, it's not just your hands that are hitting with the bow. You want your shoulder, your elbow, your knee, your hip, everything to come together so that your body, even with a weapon, acts as one mass. It's an example of all of the some parts are greater than the individual separate bits. Another way you can think about this is even with throwing techniques in grappling. So if I use Alan again, as a, an example, uh, I'll do this up this side, right? So imagine that I'm just going to do hip throw. Now, one thing to think about, if Alan's punch comes in, when I enter for my hip throw, what I don't want to do is I don't want to be rigid, because if I'm rigid, that's going to mean I'm going to be harder to accelerate. So I need to be relaxed. So once I've done my block, I relax. But when I get to the point of the throw, what I don't want to do is treat each part of my mass separate because each part then is going to be exerting its own force and going back to what I just said the individual parts aren't as effective as them all working together so if for example I sort of pull with my push with my legs pull my hands do it all separately I can sort of get a throw you know but it's it's all a bit messy what I want is at that moment when I come in for the throw is to connect with my core to breathe out as well, because that exhalation causes my muscles inside to contract, and so effectively they become denser. I am literally unifying my mass. And so my whole body is acting as one unit to execute the throw. So when I come in, it's my whole body, just like a sneeze, is the best way to think about it. Not only can you use that to execute the technique, you can use it for other things like in reverse. So for example, if Alan does hip throw on me, I can use the same moment to make my entire body act as one mass. So all of a sudden, I become very difficult to throw. What you must be careful of with that though, is if Alan does his hip throw and I lock my mass, don't stay there. Because if I stay as a rigid object, if Alan has the time to adjust, which if I do that and then he adjusts, then I'm easier to throw. So it needs to be the sneeze, it needs to be that moment and then move on again. Another example would be uh, beginning to go into the realms of my centre of mass. If Alan does Oso to Gary, for example, if I use that moment to unite my mass, all of a sudden I'm so much harder to accelerate. If I connect that with dropping my centre slightly, so it's underneath Alan, I'm now a lot more stable can easily do a reverse the technique from my position. So, one more time. So I'm underneath my opponent, it's easy to turn. So it's the idea of my whole body acting as one so that my effective mass increases. So think about the idea of effective mass, think about the consequences of it for your own training, because effective mass is in nearly every technique we do. I hope you enjoyed this video, I hope you found it useful. Please check out our blog on our website, which I'll put a link in the description below. You can subscribe to the channel here, and to check out my other latest videos, you can click this link here. Hopefully guys, see you in the comments below. See you next week.